Tuesday, May 12th, 2020. This is Brett Fremack, a.k.a. The Jazz, the Jazz Video Guy. I forgot for a second. I know who I am, I think. Today we're going to focus on Johnny Griffin. Johnny Griffin's an incredible tenor player. Favorite of mine for many, many years. Uh, Johnny Griffin is one of those cats who went to Europe in the 50s, late 50s, early 60s. He split to Europe after uh, doing a lot of playing here with Art Blakey and Thelonious Monk. We're going to talk a little bit about that phenomena of jazz musicians uh, better appreciated outside the United States. And I want to talk about a couple other things, including live streaming performances. But first, let us get to the great, the little giant himself, Johnny Griffin. <laughs> Thank you. 
You know, what's interesting is that uh, all four of those musicians were Americans who emigrated to Europe in the 50s and early 60s. Uh, Johnny Griffin, Horace Parlin, Reggie Johnson, and Alvin Queen. Now, I know Alvin. He's still there. Wonderful drummer. Johnny passed. Horace Parlin passed, I guess, about a year or two ago. And Reggie Johnson, I don't know. Let's let's get a perspective from the musicians themselves. Let's see. We're going to hear from Johnny Griffin and from Sonny Rollins. John, I know in, you had a very successful group in 61, 62 with Eddie Lockyer Davis. And I remember one record, you made Tough Tennis. Mm. But then you decided in 62 to come to Europe and stay in Europe. What was the main reason for staying in Europe? Well, um, you know, when you say we had a big success, when we, play, when we had the opportunity to play, together with this band, uh, with the two tenor saxophones and rhythm section, 
Uh, it was very, very successful. The public liked it immensely. But uh, the the agent that did the booking weren't that, uh, wasn't that interested in us. They were more concentrated on yeah. uh, Horace Silver, Odd Blakey, yeah, and Jazz Messengers, you know, and Miles Davis, because we had the same agency. So what happened was we wound up paying Eddie, Eddie and I was paying the, the, the other musicians in the band more money than we were making. So by uh, economics, the band broke up in 62. And uh, Riverside Records wanted me to come to Europe on a tour to, to kind of a promotional tour for the records I had made with Riverside. And I wasn't that interested in Europe. I said, oh, well, I go to Europe. <laughs> uh, I'm in New York City. Yeah, I'm in, that's I'm it. In heaven. Just this capital, is, huh? Yeah, this yeah. is heaven, you know. I'm in New York City, but uh, which is really funny because the president of Riverside Records took me to lunch one day, and I was never really hanging out with him. His name was uh, uh, Bill, uh, uh, Bill Grau. Bill Grau. I was hanging out with Orrin Keep News, who's the vice president. <laughs> Bill Grau was always hanging out with Cannonball. But I was hanging out with Orrin Keep News. Bill Grau took me to him and said, Johnny, if you go to Europe, you won't come back. You, you've got to be kidding. And it's funny because I, I left in December to do a, uh, just to do a tour uh, by, by Paris. I worked in Blue Note for a month, and I went to Stockholm and worked in the Golden Circle for a month. Went to Ronnie Scott's and worked for a month. And I went to Holland and worked uh, about 10 days. Went back to New York, and uh, only to run into trouble with my my wife at that at that period and uh, pff, terrible pff. that was enough uh, my, my heart was <laughs> my heart was broken anyway with my broken heart <laughs> and an income tax problem with the american yeah, government no, on top. <laughs> bad gonzalez bad gonzalez and i left and came back to europe <laughs> I don't know how you're going to translate all of no, that. No, yeah, that is, that is natürlich sehr viel zu übersetzen, weil es eine ganze Geschichte, wenn er nach Europa kam, 62. Die Antwort wohl, was, was sehr interessant ist, ist mit Eddie Lockshaw Davis, dieses Quintett. Er sagte, sie waren, es war musikalisch sehr gut, aber sie hatten große Schwierigkeiten zu überleben. Und äh, zu dieser Zeit waren Musiker wie Miles Davis und andere viel mehr gefördert. Und dann kam die Einladung über Riverside Records nach Europa. Und er sagte, er hat in Stockholm gespielt und in London. Er hatte familiäre Schwierigkeiten in New York und es war ein bisschen wie Heaven, wie der Himmel hier. Und da kam auch die Idee her, dass er in Europa bleibt. Ich weiß, dass er Ende 70er Jahre zurückgegangen ist nach New York und nach Amerika und großen Erfolg hatte. I, I know, Johnny, you uh, went back to New York and to the States in the end of 70, 70, I don't know exactly, 79. 78. And you had a, 78, you had an yeah. unbelievable success. Yeah. Was it, had it to do with all the long time you spent it in Europe or... Uh, What, what, I mean, I think that my success was the fact that a lot of people came to see me play to see if I could still play, <laughs> <laughs> which, was amusing, <laughs> which was amusing to me, really, really because Americans are like that. They, they yeah. think if you're not in America, you can, you know, how can you live over there yeah. and keep up what's going on, you know. But yeah. when I left America in the first place, I wasn't a baby. No, I mean, I was... 36 years old or something. You know, know this year you're doing. 66. How dare you? <laughs> Sorry. I mean, but that's true. That's, yeah, that's, that's true. is wahr. That's <laughs> Wir sprechen, weil als er 79, äh, 78, entschuldige, er zurückging nach New York, hatte er großen Erfolg. Und er sagte, vielleicht lag der Erfolg zum Großteil. Well, this is a very uh, loaded question, you might say. Um, music, painting, literature, the arts are never appreciated. And um, jazz is music, is an art, uh, which was never appreciated, probably less than other arts even, because it came from a minority group mainly uh, where its main practitioners. And a lot of these artists, uh, they felt, well, I'm not welcome. People don't understand my art. They don't appreciate my art. And uh, hey, I can go to Europe. 
the people in Europe love jazz ever since James Reese Europe was over there during the First World War. Wow. They appreciate jazz. They look at jazz as in as a legitimate art form. So wow, maybe I'll have a more appreciation of my art. And so a lot of guys left to be appreciated for what they thought was great work, which was, in my opinion, great work. And uh, so the exodus began. And uh, you find a lot of people going over there, many, many, many jazz artists. Uh, that's basically, that started. And uh, Don Bias was one of these great players you know, I, I remember when I was going to high school, there used to be a, a uh, record store in the 42nd Street subway station that had all the pictures of all the jazz musicians. It was a photographer named Popsy. And he had all of the guys, and there was a great picture he had of Don Bias. Uh, you know, he was sort of on the set and he's looking up and he's there with his son. And, uh, but anyway, yeah, Don Bias was one of the great people that left the United States and uh, hoping to get his, his music appreciated. Now, obviously, Sidney Duchesne became a national hero in France. What about these other gentlemen, like Don Bias and Dexter Gordon and Janet Griffin? They were your friends. Do you think they were happier because they moved here? Ah, that's a difficult question. Uh, someone that was closer to me was a pianist, Kenny Drew, who went to Europe and eventually uh, settled in Europe. Um, was he happier in Europe? Uh, Did he get more recognition than they would in the United States? Well, the recognition is, is the, the he, Kelly, of course, coming from the United States, gave you your imprimatur. That was your say, oh, they knew you were great. He's a, from the United States. In other words, if there was a Kenny Drew that was born in Denmark, he wouldn't be appreciated. If they played at the same level, of course. So part of Kenny's and these other people, they came from the United States. The United States is the home of this uh, art form. I mean, to the, I'm not a historian, but much of jazz seems to have originated in the United States. So let's go with that for the moment. Um, so these people from the United States were always looked up to in Europe as being more legitimate and being the true expressors of this art. So Kenny Drew and these people, I don't, your question was, are they happy in Europe? They left the United States for, you know, the reasons that you stated. Did they find peace and some form of peace and happiness? Well, I, that's a difficult question. Um, uh, ben Webster, the great uh, saxophonist, the great tenor saxophonist, one of our greats, uh, Ben Webster was sort of not very happy with his life, from what I can discern, when he was in the States. And when I saw him in Europe, I don't think he, he had still 
so what Ben Webster was looking for was something maybe a little different than uh, recognition of his art. I think everybody in Europe and the United States, they all, they, they all recognize Ben Webster. Uh, but, uh, you know, Ben Webster said, uh, Tell somebody a quote like when he was in Europe, he always seemed to be sort of sad to me, looking sad. I mean, that he was not fulfilled in certain, but he told somebody one time, he said, house, country, dog. That's what I think he really wanted. Family, house, country, dog, he wanted that. That's my understanding, and he, and he didn't achieve that. Uh, so his case might be, he went to Europe like he, somebody would go to any other place, uh, not necessarily for the uh, musical appreciation. That orchestra, he broke the color barrier and they were happy to have him. It was him and people like Cozy Cole who were able to get into these higher paid, more more um, prestigious, perhaps you may say, uh, jobs and a lot of other jazz musicians uh, didn't get it. So, I mean, we may be trying to lump all the jazz musicians together in this big melange. It's not, they're all separate. Right. Basically, they went to Europe because jazz was appreciated in Europe. The music started off in the black ghettos, of course, now it's worldwide. Everybody's playing, everybody that feels like that, because it's, it's a lifestyle, it's a feeling. It's a feeling of walking down the street. It's a feeling of how you walk, or how you talk, how you approach other people, how you receive and express yourselves verbally, orally, or the love that you have for your fellow man. It's all that's a part of it. <laughs> Getting ready for the festival. Just that. Talk about. Oh, you're kidding. Oh, my goodness. Don't zoom me. Don't zoom me. Don't zoom me. Don't zoom me. With, don't zoom me. with the microphone. With the boom. Oh, my God. Yeah, him on the floor. That's why it's so beautiful to play in clubs. Because the people right there, you can touch them. Phew. That's it. So you get the, you can feel the vibration. There's that interplay of vibrations that helps with the magic, because this is what this music is, that helps with the magic of this music called jazz, because it is magic. That's right, feel good, feel good. That's what this music is all about, feel good, feel good. Don't worry about the taxes that you have to pay. Taxes, how did that come about? <laughs> hey, now we're going to do a tune that I composed and dedicated to the high priest of modern jazz, Thelonious Monk. A tune called A Monk's Dream.
jazz is the fact that it can change daily. You can hear me play tonight, and I can play the same tunes tomorrow night, but they'll never be the same. Because as a person, I change daily. And besides, I don't memorize what I'm doing anyway. The sheer joy of playing jazz is to, to, to be able to express yourself so that the people can feel it. The audience as a whole coming in to take a trip, and you direct them on a trip, taking them to, to places, to view, to have visions that you've had that they have never experienced. This to me is jazz. Of course, swing. The bass is the whole thing. Is that important? The swing. Yeah. Uh, it's like Duke Ellington says, I believe the same. if there's no swing, there's no jazz. It don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. I mean, you can say improvisational music and you can go into all kind of forms and but I don't think they should really call it jazz unless it swings. Unless that pulse is there. That feeling of too far. Yeah. You know, there's another reason why so many jazz musicians left the United States besides the lack of appreciation for the music. And that's because they were black men. And this has never been, sadly, a great country for African-American people. You know, there's a jazz festival in uh, 1949. Uh, I forget, it was in Paris. I forget exactly where it was. And um, Miles and Bird and James Moody and Tad Dameron, a lot of people went over to the play and they were just surprised by the love that they got. And Miles was seriously considering staying there. Uh, he was hanging out with uh, the uh, actor Jean Moreau and uh, another, uh, another uh, French actress that he had a relationship with, Julia Greco, and, and uh, in dialogue with people like Jean-Paul Sartre, the existential philosopher. It was impossible in the United States. Eventually, Miles came back, but... Racism was pretty, pretty heavy at that time. And has it changed? Well, if you're in the United States and you follow the headlines in the past couple of weeks, we know that uh, in Georgia, two men uh, sought out and gunned down an African-American man and killed him for no reason at all. That is America. And I hope that changes. I don't know if it will. Now, back to the music. You know, one of my great barometers for great music is, can you play a ballad? Thank you. 
Johnny Griffin. Certainly knew his way around the horn, that's for sure. Another reason that uh, Johnny Griffin was so great, could really play a ballad. The uh, current situation in the United States is, God, very upsetting. We need some positive changes on the horizon here, certainly. I don't know if and when they'll come, but uh, this crisis certainly eliminates uh, the health care problems in the United States. And the current crisis uh, is going to yield some good things as well. It's been a lot of pain and suffering. One of the good things, I think, is this increase in live streaming performances. I mean, if you're on Facebook, you could spend an hour a day with Chick Corea. Chick Corea does a live stream for an hour every day from his studio. And he's been doing it for like a month now. And it's so great to see that, to hear that. Uh, Nicholas Payton, another guy who's on Facebook doing that. Uh, Keb Mo, I saw. I'm a big Keb Mo fan, great blues guitarist. So suddenly this medium is being transformed into a performance space. Now, there are certain limitations with the audio and some of the video, depending on how these uh, things are produced. But I find that to be encouraging. And I, I think that all musicians need to do this now for several reasons. One, because we need healing. Music is a healing force in the universe. And it certainly has that effect on me. And by putting, for a musician to put their music out there now, you're gonna heal some people. And also you're gonna heal yourself. You know, I, uh, as a filmmaker, I kind of got stopped in my tracks by this whole thing. Because I was working on a great film about anti-Semitism. I was working with Holocaust survivors. Boom! I got to stop. Now, I am not someone who allows obstacles to floor me. Instead, I got up off the floor when I found that I couldn't fi uh, uh, finish my film. And I said, let me do this live thing. And now this is evolving. And starting later this week and next week, I'm going to have... Uh, some uh, performances along with the interviews that I do. And, you know, it's very easy to do a live performance. I, I said something, Alexa is like talking to me. Alexa, stop. I don't know why she does that. Alexa, stop. I got artificial intelligence. Uh, so uh, easy to do a live performance. I mean, you can just literally use a, an iPhone uh, and, uh, of course, uh, you need a tripod, you need some lights, you need a microphone, but those don't cost a hell of a lot of money. Uh, I'm probably going to do a video for musicians. Uh, short is good. Uh, on a regular basis is good. It would be nice if uh, there was a website you could go where you could see all the live streaming performances because there's no, there's no TV guide or anything for jazz. Uh, so, uh, you know, you have to look for them. But uh, I think that uh, in this interim period, I have no idea how long it's going to last. We're not going to be able to go to clubs or concerts. And certainly I want to hear something different, something new. And other people do as well. So, and musicians can't find the work, but still want to reach the audience. Live streaming is the answer to that. I'm going to go out today with uh, a little bit more of Johnny Griffin. Uh, it's been great fun, and uh, come back tomorrow for an interview uh, with my buddy Julie Loken. Julie of New Audiences Productions produced some of the great jazz concerts in New York in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, including a particularly memorable concert with Charles Mingus, kind of a, like a comeback concert for Mingus. So we'll look at some Mingus video as well. Julie will talk about working with Miles and Weather Report and a lot of other cool stuff. So thanks for stopping by and come by tomorrow. See you then.
Jazz video guy, take two. Jazz video guy live is a production of Arcadian Arts, a 501c nonprofit organization. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tips, subscriptions, contributions are greatly appreciated. Even one dollar helps. Uh, there's some links in the comments, so you can do that. Uh, I produce this entirely on my own. It's an entirely a one-man band, a one-man show. I do it because I love this music, and it's big fun, but I'm trying to make a living as well. So if you can help with a small contribution, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much. See you tomorrow.